Welcome back to Philosophy for Flourishing, the show where we explore principles and practices for living the best, most fulfilled life possible. On the last few episodes, I've been sharing with you guys some of the work I was doing while I wasn't doing the podcast. And I've got another one of those today. It's a lecture that I gave in a course called Ayn Rand Integrations. And here I'm integrating and showing the similarities and some differences between the ideas of Ayn Rand and the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher Thomas Reed. I had a ton of fun doing it because both of these figures have lots of great ideas for flourishing, and I think you guys will see that in the in the lecture. It also just give you a taste of this course, and we are going to be doing more of these to come. Uh, I'll probably be covering figures like Maria Montessori, Francis Bacon, Baruch Spinoza, and many, many more. So keep your eyes peeled for further iterations of the Ayn Rand Integrations course, and enjoy this lecture on Thomas Reed and Ayn Rand. John Hersey uh, is the managing editor at Objective Standard, the Objective Standard, uh, where he writes about current events and philosophy and history and art. Um, he also is a fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education, as well as at Objective Standard Institute, where he also teaches. Um, and so far, John has taught primarily about uh, writing in defense of liberty, which he has much experience in doing, but he's also I'm going to be teaching a uh, reading group on the Romantic Manifesto, so branching out into art a little bit more, uh, which he also has a lot of interest and experience in. So, But today, uh, he will be focusing on Thomas Reed, so John also has an interest in Scottish Enlightenment philosophers, and I will stop talking there and let John take over. Thank you for that introduction, Angel, and thank you for thinking of and putting together this course. I think it's a wonderful idea, and I'm so happy to talk to you guys today about one of my favorite philosophers, one of the people I think is one of the most fascinating figures in the history of philosophy, Thomas Reed. And I hope by the end of today to convince you guys of that as well. So for some context, Thomas Reed's dates are 1710 to 1796. That means he was born six years after John Locke died, four years after Benjamin Franklin was born, a year before David Hume was born, and 14 years before Immanuel Kant was born. Like Kant, Reed was a professor for most of his life, or about half of his career, I guess we could say. And like Kant too, his life was fairly uneventful. Not a lot to talk about in terms of biographical details, but what he lacked in adventure, he more than made up for with the intellectual depth and rigor of his intellectual life. Also, unlike Kant, he was virtually groomed to champion the experimental inductive method. His family included some of the most formidable minds in Scotland. He had two uncles who were professors of mathematics at Scottish universities, and they were some of the first in Scotland to actually teach the ideas of Isaac Newton's Principia. He had another uncle, uh, David Gregory, who was a, a Oxford astronomy professor and an intimate friend of Isaac Newton's. And uh, David Gregory is interesting because he also was one of the first inventors of the reflecting telescope. Thomas Reed enters Marischal College at the age of 12 or 13. They went to school, started college very early back then. And he was taught under the venerable George Turnbull, who introduced him to the ideas of Francis Bacon, Rene Descartes, Isaac Newton, John Locke, the Earl of Shaftesbury, Hugo Grotius, Samuel Pufendorf, all the great Enlightenment minds. George Turnbull taught, I'm going to read some quotes here, and by the way, uh, Angel has a sheet with quotes on it. I do want to share a, a lot of quotes today. Um, most of them are from Reed. I think that Reed's prose style is just beautiful. It's, it's incredible to read. It's really fun. So I want to give you guys a good taste of that. This quote, though, is from George Turnbull. He said that the study of nature, whether in the constitution and economy of the sensible world or in the frame and government of the moral, must set out from the same principles and be carried on in the same method of investigation, induction, and reasoning. So the world he taught, Thomas Reed, 
George Turnbull taught to Thomas Reed, the world is one continuous whole. And whether we're, in, we're interested in questions about natural philosophy or moral philosophy, we have to set out using the same method, which is reasoning from sensory evidence. They also taught that philosophers have no, they have no hegemony over language, whether written or spoken words. So those distinctions that most languages recognize typically have a real basis in fact. And this is important as we'll see later in Reed's philosophy. So Reed graduates from school, he becomes the school librarian at Marshall College and he uses his downtime to chew the ideas of Bacon or rather Newton's Principia Mathematica. So he's spending a lot of time in the library learning about science and math. And Alexander Brody, who is a, an, a Scottish enlightenment expert, just an expert in general, on Enlightenment philosophy said that Reed actually had the deepest understanding of Newtonian science of any of the major 18th century thinkers. Uh, but the scientific hero that he most admired, that Reed most admired, was not Newton, but Newton's intellectual progenitor, Francis Bacon. He wrote, did not Bacon's book Novum Organum give birth to the art of induction? Was there ever a book in the world that delineated so important an art so justly and so minutely before that art had in existence. Has not Newton in his optics and in his astronomy followed Bacon's precepts step by step? His writings are forgotten and it is too little known that the spirit of Newton and Locke descended from the loins of Lord Bacon. Love that. So Locke's natural philosophy too, by the way, is very much inspired by Francis Bacon. If you're interested in this topic, uh, there's a great book written by Peter Anstey, a professor of philosophy in Australia, and it's called John Locke's Natural Philosophy. I actually reviewed it for TOS. And just throwing this out there, perhaps for a future iteration of this course, we should do Francis Bacon, because I think he would make a, just a great figure to integrate with Rand. So next up in, in Reed's career, for the next 15 years, he spends as a preacher in New Mashar. And although he's deep re re religious, he disdained the gloomy, enthusiastical cast of those who are fanatical in their religion. So he's a true free thinker, as we'll see in a little bit. And instead of writing his own sermons, he actually would just reread the sermons of other well-known preachers like this guy, John Tillotson and others. And he used, again, he used his downtime for study. He was studying the questions of math, science, and philosophy, starting to write essays and build a reputation as a capable intellectual. So in 1752, he's appointed professor of philosophy at King's College in Aberdeen. And he's there, he's teaching math, physics, logic, and ethics. Can you imagine Carrie Ann, for instance, having to teach all of these subjects in a modern university? And this is, this is just incredible. He's also lecturing on astronomy, chemistry, and after he reads the writings of Benjamin Franklin, he's teaching uh, electricity as well, which is one of the most popular topics of the day. He does original research and writing on light and optics, and he's no mere dabbler in matters of science. The editors of the Cambridge Companion on Thomas Reed, which I recommend, they are Terence Cuneo and Rene Van Woodenberg, say that Reed is arguably the most learned and expert concerning scientific issues of all of the major 18th century philosophers. And he's no cloistered academic either. He thinks, like Aristotle, that the purpose of science is to improve our lives. So he joins, for instance, the Gordon's Mill Farming Club, and he's interested in such questions as using lime as fertilizer, distilling potatoes, plant nutrition, the composition of spa waters. Now, today, if a philosophy professor joins a farming club, it's probably on some commune somewhere. And instead of celebrating progress and trying to make more of it, he's probably there to protest human progress. So this is a completely different type of philosopher, right? And all of these things going on, his curiosity is still not sated. So he founds the Aberdeen Philosophical Society. Aberdeen Philosophical Society concerned itself a lot with the writings of David Hume. In 1739, Hume released his first book, well, not actually his first book, but one of his first books on philosophy, a treatise on human nature. And he said that it fell stillborn from the press and elicited not even like a murmur of protest. Um, if only that were true, unfortunately, we know that uh, Hume's book would go on to wake Kant from his dogmatic slumber. But on the more positive side, it also spurred Reed to rethink some of his philosophical ideas, some of the ideas 
that he had long held and gotten from John Locke. And the venue for thinking through those ideas and presenting papers and talking through them was his philosophical society, Aberdeen Philosophical Society. So over the next several years, through discussion at this philosophical society, he comes up with the core of his book, Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. It's a great book, beautifully written, long title I know, but lots of books had long titles back then. And it's really important, I think, underappreciated book in the history of philosophy. So this comes out in 1764. And that same year, Adam Smith cedes his position as professor of moral philosophy at the University of Glasgow. And Reed is called upon to take his place. So Reed moves to Glasgow, goes from the relative backwater of Aberdeen to a thriving commercial hub in Glasgow. He joins the Glasgow Literary Society. So he's there alongside the phys uh, chemist and, and physicist Joseph Black, who's known for having discovered magnesium and the phenomena of latent heat, uh, on which Reed actually attended Black's lectures. There's the physician chemist uh, William Cullen, who was the teacher to Benjamin Rush, a really important uh, American founder and physician. Uh, there's John Morgan as well. He was a co-founder of one of the first medical colleges in America. And for a little for a little while, also Scotland's then leading philosopher, David Hume, is part of the Glasgow Literary Society as well. And Hume's first reaction to Reed's inquiry is scorn. He actually, he said he wishes that the Parsons would confine themselves to their old task of worrying one another and leave philosophers to argue with moderation, temper, and good manners. But he changes his tune. As he reads through and considers Reed's more, uh, ideas more and more, he comes to see them as deeply philosophical. He loves the writing. He says it's spirited and entertaining. And he says that if Reed indeed does manage to clear up some of the issues in philosophy, that he'll claim a share of the praise since he's the one who brought these issues to the fore and really spurred Reed to, to go and investigate them. So Reed spends the rest of his career at the University of Glasgow. He retires in 1781 at the age of 71 to put together his life's work in the form of a book. And he begins writing in 1781. And the thing grows and grows and grows. And in 1785, he publishes his Essays on the Intellectual Powers of Man, but he still has more to say. So there's a second book. It's the Essays on the Active Powers of Man. And these are his books on epistemology and ethics, respectively. So to put these in context, just in terms of timing, Kant's first edition of the Critique of Pure Reason was published in 1781, the same year that Reed retired. And Kant's uh, book on morals was published in 1785, the same year that Reed published his essays on the intellectual powers of man. So these books, like respectively, they combat epistemological skepticism and moral relativism. And we're gonna start with the epistemology. We wanna get the hard stuff out of the way so we can just enjoy the morality stuff because that's all gravy. All right, so point one is that Reed attacked the skepticism of modern philosophy at the root. And he, he attacked what he came to call the theory of ideas, or what philosophers today call representationism. All right, so modern philosophy had foundered in just total skepticism. And I just want to give a quick recap for illustration. I don't expect you to follow on and necessarily agree with everything I'm going to say here, but just to give you an idea of the context in which Reed was writing. So Descartes had said that we should ignore the evidence of the senses that we should consult innate ideas, that these are the source of all knowledge, these ideas baked into the fabric of our minds. Locke said, wait a second, there's no innate ideas. We start out, the mind is tabula rasa. And all the ideas that we ever get are, they're gotten from experience. However, the only thing that we ever actually perceive are our ideas. These ideas in our minds are the only things that we have access to. Barclay then responds, Bishop Barclay says, well, why do you think that there is any such thing as an external world if all we perceive are our ideas? Uh, couldn't it just be the case that it's just God creating all these ideas directly in our minds? To which Hume responds, well, there is no God. There's only a constant stream of impressions and ideas. So we've thrown everything out. Reed actually quips to this. He says, what if at last, having nothing else to contend with, these impressions and ideas should fall foul of one another and leave no existence in nature at all. So philosophers have basically killed off everything that we know exists in this world of philosophy. 
And Reed thinks that a, a key cause of this is what he calls the theory of ideas. He says to a friend that the essence of, of his philosophy lies, I think, chiefly in having called in question the common theory of ideas or images of things in the mind being the only objects of thought. So if you're paying attention during Carrie Ann's presentation, then you might notice a slight rub here. Carrie Ann quoted Aristotle saying, whenever one contemplates, one must at the same time contemplate a sort of image for images are like objects perceived, except that they are without matter. Also ellipsing out some things here. Also someone who thinks sets out an object before the mind's eye. So this is what Descartes thinks. He has, uh, he has set aside all of his prior learning. He said that in order to have a firm foundation for knowledge, we need to uh, basically throw out all the knowledge of the past and start over. But he accepts without really much thought about how and why he's accepting it, this theory of ideas. And he says that the senses convey images of external things to the mind through this medium of ideas. Has anyone ever seen that movie Inside Out? the Pixar movie and like the emotions. So if you have it, like the emotions are characters inside this little girl's mind and they are making ideas come to, to the fore in her mind because they have these little like glowing balls that are memories and they can place them on this little pedestal and then she starts thinking about this thing. And it's kind of a good analogy for the theory of ideas. It's that there are these things, they're not actually material but there's something in the mind, they're images it's kind of like a TV screen inside your mind. And this is what you're perceiving is what, you know, what is uh, given to you by your ideas. So this is what philosophers call representationism. It's that these ideas represent the outside world to the mind's eye. And of course, there's a problem here. We've already hit upon it with Locke. It's that all we perceive are these ideas according to representationists. So we are hopelessly cut off from reality. In the end, this leads to skepticism, says Reed. And this, this theory of ideas was transmitted from Descartes to Locke to Berkeley to Hume and even to Immanuel Kant. So Reed is here in, in this context and he's questioning this theory of ideas. Locke uses it so much, he uses ideas, the word so much in his essays concerning human understanding that he actually begs pardon of his readers for, for relying on the concept so much. And he only gives one paragraph devoted to explaining what these ideas are. He said, ideas are whatsoever, whatsoever is the object of the understanding when a man thinks. And he thought that this idea of the theory of ideas would be easily granted. And it certainly was. As Hume scholar Barry Stroud said, Hume never asks himself whether the theory of ideas is correct, and he never gives any arguments in support of it. And on Reed's survey, this was virtually true of every one of the modern philosophers. He said that the whole history of philosophy has never furnished an instance of an opinion so unanimously entertained by philosophers upon such slight grounds. So, of course, we have ideas insofar as we think things. Reed stresses this. We think things. We have mental actions. The mind takes actions. But in any operation of the mind, there are three things. There is the object, there is the mind, and then there's the action of the mind. So, for instance, I've got this cool little Aristotle lamp here that I got from James Biller at Toscon, the first Toscon, I think it was. So right now, there is the object, there's my mind, and there's the action of my mind in perceiving the object, right? So there are three elements. And this holds it for imagination as well, because this confused me when I first read about this theory. It's like, wait a second, what about imagination? We can imagine things. There seems to be something in the mind, some kind of image, right? So right now, if I'm imagining a pizza, for instance, there is my mind, there's the action of my mind, which is actually bringing to the fore these ideas, these images of pizza. But what is it that I'm actually imagining? Well, Reed would say, what you're imagining is a combination of things that you've perceived in the past. So still the object of your perception is some kind of memory, some physical thing that you've perceived in the past. So it's still the case, says Reed, that ideas are, uh, we're, we're correct insofar as we think of ideas as actions of the mind, whether that action be perception, imagination, thinking of some sort. You probably heard the phrase uh, used by David Allen that the mind is for having ideas and not for holding them. And I think Reed would really agree with that. He'd probably add something like the mind is for thinking thoughts, not for holding them. It's not this cabinet into which we can place 
the little orbs of ideas like are, are in that movie inside out. Rather, it is more like a muscle. If we extend Reed's thinking here with a, a, an analogy he did not use, we can think of the mind more like a muscle. And what it does is it grasps things and it can grasp things that are already out there or it can grasp new combinations of things that it, it itself is putting together. And I like to think of this in terms of muscle memory as well. If you think about when you're like learning Back in Black by ACDC on the guitar, like the more that you play the song, the more quickly and accurately you're going to be able to do that. And like the more that you think about, for instance, Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism or Karl Marx's communism, the more th you think about that, the more accurately and precisely you can grab, grab onto those ideas. And if you don't think about something for a long period of time, it's not like, oh, I can just go to the cabinet and pull out the idea and there it is again. It's, no, you're like rebuilding that muscle memory sort of thing with your mind. So again, just to recap here, Reed says that there are three elements of any operation of the mind. There is the object, the mind, and the mind's action. But he says philosophers have added to this a fourth element, the idea. And the idea is not an action, it's the actual material upon which the mind acts. So Reed says, there is reason to distrust any philosophical theory when it leads men to corrupt language and to confound under one name operations of the mind, which common sense and common language teach them to distinguish. So here's that point from George Turnbull earlier about language and philosophers having no hegemony over the use of language. And you might recognize what Reed is talking about here. He's saying we shouldn't confound or, under one name things that are actually distinct, which of course is a great anticipation of Rand's identification of the package deal. And what the modern philosophies here are packaging, according to Reed, is the actions of the mind with the objects of the mind. They're reifying actions of the mind as things, much like Plato did with his forms. So this mistake, Reed thinks, was caused by what he called the way of analogy. We've gotten here because we're analogizing how the mind works with how things act physically in the world. And he says, we think, for instance, philosophers talk about this theory of ideas with the language of, of ideas having impressions on the mind. And they did so in large part because, especially at this time, philosophers and scientists alike believed that there could be no action on the mind at a distance. Nothing can act on something else at a distance. It has to be physically touching somehow to act on it. And this even delayed, it long delayed the acceptance of Newton's theories of gravity because people just didn't think that you could have things acting at a distance. It just didn't make sense to them. They're used to looking out at the world, just intuitively seeing things hitting one another and that is the cause of how things work. So, <clears throat> Reed says, this analogy doesn't make sense, we should throw it out. He gives two main counter arguments to the theory of ideas. One, he says, there's no evidence for it. You know, again, Descartes had said, uh, let's throw out everything for which there is no evidence and start fresh with knowledge. And, and Reed's saying, well, you kind of didn't do that. You've accepted this theory of ideas and you really don't have any evidence for it. So he, using Rand's language, Reed would say that the theory of ideas is arbitrary. Um, and then a second counter argument was, well, even if we grant the existence of these ideas, they still don't explain the phenomena involved. They still don't explain perception because let's say, for instance, that these ideas impress upon the mind. Well, a seal impresses upon wax, but we don't thereby suppose that the wax perceives anything. A hammer can impress upon the hood of my car but I don't suppose that the hood of my car perceives anything. So these ideas impinging upon our minds doesn't actually explain perception. So why not just grant that we can perceive objects at a distance instead, because this seems to be borne out by our experience. It just makes, makes way more sense instead of inventing a causal factor for which we have no evidence to just grant that we actually perceive things at a distance. Yeah. So big point number one is that Reed threw out the theory of ideas as arbitrary and as a sure route to skepticism. Oh, and what here is the parallel to Rand? I'm sure you guys have sort of already grasping for this. Uh, is there anyone here who is actually not familiar with Rand's philosophy at all? Okay, 
Let me know if not. So I'm going to kind of speed through some of the connections to RAND so we can spend more time on read. I'm taking for granted some familiarity, familiarity with RAND. So RAND says two fundamental attributes are involved in every state, aspect, or function of man's consciousness, content and action, the content of awareness and the action of consciousness in regard to that content. To form concepts of consciousness, one must isolate the action from the content of a given state of consciousness by a process of abstraction. So here Rand is making a tripartite distinction. She's thinking, she's saying there's man's consciousness, there's the action of that consciousness and the content of that consciousness. So it's the same tripartite distinction that Reed makes. Um, she also says that concepts are not things in the, in the sense that they have some metaphysical existence. She says a concept is a mental integration of two or more units. And what is a mental integration? Well, you can frame it like that as a noun, as this thing, but actually an integration is an action of the mind. It's the mind grasping some facts of reality on the basis of similarities and differences. So concepts are actions of the mind. They're not things, whether those things are in Plato's world of forms or here in our minds right now, uh, you know, things on the screens of our minds. So that's big point number one for Reed is the throws out this theory of ideas as arbitrary and a sure route to skepticism. I wanna keep going, but if you feel the urge to stop me to ask a question, do. I just, I have a lot to get through and I'm willing to stay over as long as need be to answer questions at the end as well. All right, so big point number two, Reed championed direct realism. And I'll get into what that means. But baked into this theory of ideas is what I'll call a resemblance hypothesis. In order to convey knowledge to us, the ideas that we are using to represent the things out there in the, in the physical world must actually resemble those things out there. So the images in our heads must mirror the things that they are representing. So think about it like this. I set you up on a blind date with my beautiful friend, Charlotte. You are all excited about it. You're a guy in this example, whoever you are, and you're all excited about it. You, you know, put on your best suit, you make a reservation at the nicest restaurant in town, and you go out to take your, my friend Charlotte out to dinner. And you're there for about five minutes before you realize that Charlotte has actually sent her secretary in her stead. Not her, she didn't come to the date. So you come into your next OSI class and I'm like all excited to ask you about your date with Charlotte. And I'm like, wasn't she pretty? What'd you think? And you're like, I have no idea. She sent her secretary instead. Well, then I might say, well, actually, you know what? Her secretary is her identical twin sister. So then now you have some basis to gauge whether or not you think Charlotte's pretty. Well, Locke said that some of our ideas are like this. They're identical twins to the things that we perceive in reality. So the idea in our minds resembles this identical twin of the thing out there in the actual world. So even though we don't perceive the actual world, we perceive something that resembles it. It's Charlotte's identical twin sister, even if it's not Charlotte. Um, but other ideas don't. Other ideas don't resemble the things out there in the, in the actual world. So let's use another example here. So let's say that we have a strawberry and we all see the strawberry. We see that there's one strawberry, not like three or four. We see its shape. We see the same shape. We see it has the same, we all see the same texture. If I were to throw it up in the air and catch it, we'd all see the same motion. But let's suppose like I just brushed my teeth. You just ate some uh, chocolate cake or drank some orange juice or something and we both take a bite of the strawberry, we're gonna have very different perceptions of its flavor. And so this, these qualities don't necessarily resemble something out there in the actual world. They're, they're just really caused by, caused by our means of perception, so to speak. And Locke called these secondary qualities as opposed to the, the primary qualities. And he says, of these secondary qualities, but they, they don't resemble the actual things that they're supposed to represent. And so they don't actually give us any knowledge of the world. So, you know, of course we can point out to Locke that he's not on very firm ground to make any of these claims, 
because he's already said that we never perceive the world. If we never perceive the world, then we have nothing to, to compare our ideas to. So it's like seeing Charlotte's supposed identical twin sister, but never seeing Charlotte. We can't actually compare the two to see if they really resemble one another. So Locke's not on firm ground here, but it doesn't matter. Berkeley is going to take Berkeley, sorry, is going to take Locke's thinking here a step further. And he says, we only ever perceive sensible qualities. So we never perceive anything but sensible qualities. And sensible qualities can only exist in sentient beings. He says, nothing but an idea can be like an idea. So think about it like this. If you and I only ever correspond by email, I'm never ever going to know your mannerisms of speech, the way the sound of your voice, things like that. Your emails can be like other emails but they cannot be like anything that is not an email. They can, they can never be like their source. So I, Barclay is saying ideas can never be like anything but ideas. They can never be like something out there in the world. So in terms of our first example, it's secretaries all the way down. So Reed recognizes that there's something right about what Locke and Barclay are saying. They have something here, but they're not really expressing it well. So, he says that sensations are indeed the products of this process involving our sense organs and our minds. So these, they are processed, meaning they have to be distinct from their material causes in some way. They don't simply mirror the, the material causes. So if the resemblance hypothesis is true, as all of the other modern philosophers seem to think, then skepticism is inescapable. But Locke, uh, Reed says it's not true. And the entire edifice of skepticism crumbles to the ground by a very simple observation, which is that we do directly perceive the world via sensations that do not resemble their causes. So this is you know, complex. I want to get into it here. This is a new theory of natural direct realism without precedent in the history of philosophy. It says that we perceive external things via this causal process wherein our sensations don't actually resemble external things but nonetheless result in our automatically perceiving those things via direct perception. I'm gonna read a quote from, from Reed on this. Sensation and then the perception of external objects by the senses, though very different in their nature, have commonly been considered as one in the same thing. So here again, people are packaging sensation and perception, which they ought not. The purposes of common life do not make it necessary to distinguish them though, and the received opinions of philosophers tend rather to confound them. So Reed is actually credited as the first thinker in history to distinguish between sensations and perceptions, which of course we know Rand later makes use of that. Carrie Ann's shaking her head, so I'm sure I'll get some flack about this later. Um, he's credited by these guys, so blame them. <clears throat> All right. We'll get into why that's not true, I'm sure, in the Q&A. Visible appearances change constantly with variations in distance and light and the state of our eyes, but our minds learn to pass instantly and insensibly from our sensations to our perceptions. We automatize the connection between sensations and perceptions the same way that we automatize the connection between words and the things that the words signify. So, Visible appearance, uh, writes Reed, the visible appearance of things in my room varies almost every hour according as the day is clear or cloudy, as the sun is in the east or the south or the west, as my eye is in one part of the room or in another. But I never think of these variations otherwise than as signs of morning, noon, or night, of a clear or cloudy sky. A book or a chair has a different appearance to the eye in every different distance and position, yet we conceive it still to be the same. And overlooking the appearance, we immediately conceive the real figure, distance, and position of the body of which its visible or perspective appearance is a sign in education. Rand is going to greatly clarify this idea later on with the terms form and means of perception. We have, for, uh, we might have the same means of perception, but our form of perceiving it might be slightly different based on different causal factors in that causal chain. What Reed is saying, though, is that our sensations are these signs that we never actually are aware of, except perhaps in early infancy, 
And maybe he says, maybe artists are able to attend to their sensations, but if they can, it takes a lot of very, very hard work. But we automatically pass from sensations to the signs by which we, the, the signs, uh, sorry, the sensations are signs by which we perceive the actual existence out there in the world. So we pass from sensations to things signified. Another good analogy for this is, um, we know that when we flip a switch, electricity goes through a wire and turns on a light. We don't see the electricity, we see the light, we see the final cause. And Reed think, thinks something similar happens with sensations. It's, we don't see the sensations, but we see what they cause, which is our direct perception of the outside world. Um, gives a few more great examples that I'm gonna skip in order to keep our time here. Um, <clears throat> so in essence, if we could, as Locke and Hume said, single out the atoms of perception, these sensations, and somehow compare those sensations to the external world by use of something, then we would find out that those sensations don't actually resemble the things that they are, that we're perceiving by them. They're variable and they change with different changes in causal factors, but we don't perceive our sensations. We're not aware of our sensations. We're just aware of the objects that we directly perceive by them. Okay, sorry about my dog. So some people might ask, okay, well, doesn't this actually make Reed an indirect realist? So direct realist means we directly perceive the external world. Indirect realism means that there's some medium between us and the world. And it seems as though Reed is kind of saying, well, yeah, we perceive the external world via the means of sensations. And Reed's defense here would be that we have no prior awareness of the sensations. So although there is a causal mechanism by uh, the, the, a process by which we perceive the external world, we perceive this external world directly, the same way that we perceive the light and not the electricity going through the wire. So you could argue with Reed on that point. Um, I'm uh, happy to talk more about that in the question period if you like. But uh, in the estimate of Reed scholars, Reed stands alone as the only modern philosopher who's upholding direct realism and presentationism as opposed to indirect realism or naive realism and representationism. If you wanna go you know, have at it on uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. All right, so parallel with Rand here. Uh, Rand too championed a form of direct realism and she too reputed, repudiated what I'm calling the resemblance hypothesis. She did so, as I mentioned earlier, using her distinction between means and form. So she, uh, she says that yes, we do perceive things via a process of perception. It involves both the object of awareness and our means of awareness and changes in either of those two things or any sort of relevant differences in the sensory faculties between observers is going to have some kind of impact on our perception because perception is a process. A percept in Rand's view is the result of a causal process involving both the object of awareness and our means of awareness. But she also thinks it's incomprehensible on in that view to speak of a resemblance between a percept and an object because Although metaphysically, there are two things. There is the object that we're perceiving and there's us perceiving it. Epistemologically, there's just one process that unites those two things. So the percept can't be like, like reality or like something in our minds. It's a combination of the two things. Percepts are objective, another way of putting this. They're objective. They're not intrinsic as in being out there in the world and they're not subjective being solely in our minds. So Reed upheld, uh, he, he upheld direct realism in uh, contrast to every other modern philosopher. Another element of Reed's epistemological views, and you can probably see this one coming, is that Reed upheld the validity of the senses, but he also said that the senses are axiomatic sources of knowledge. And I'd be interested if uh, and how much he got this from Aristotle, but he says that the, the senses are axiomatic basis for all of our knowledge about the world. So he was more expert in the physiology of perception than any other enlightenment philosopher. So not only would this be like taking a class 
uh, philosophy class from someone like Richard Feynman, it'd be like Richard Feynman combined, combined with House MD. Like we get like this incredible scientist philosopher that is able to teach us about philosophy, but also relate it to all of these concepts of physics and science. So again, he says, true perception is facilitated by certain physical organs, certain means and instruments by which the appointment of nature must intervene between the object and our perception of it. And by these, our perceptions are limited and regulated. Yeah, that's true. You know, he's, he's granting the argument against the senses here. He's saying, yes, they are uh, conditioned by our organs of perception. But, and, and he also points out things like Rand's means form distinction. For instance, um, if you press gently on one of your eyes, uh, you can see something that is fairly close. You can see it double because in normal vision, light is reflected off the object and it goes into corresponding points on your retina of both eyes. But when you gently press on one of the eyes, it uh, misses the corresponding point and goes to a point that doesn't correspond. So we see we have double vision. So changes in the process of perception cause changes in the uh, in the actual perception. He says, we may by a variety of optical experiments change the appearance of figure and magnitude in a body as well as that of color. We, make, we may make one body appear to be 10, um, uh, but all men believe that as a multiplying glass does not really produce 10 guineas out of one, a multiplying glass being this thing that you can use to make multiple images of the same thing, as a multiplying glass does not really produce 10 guineas out of one, nor a microscope turn a guinea into a 10 pound piece. So neither does a colored glass change the real color of the object seen through it when it changes the appearance of that color. So Reed is here saying that supposed fallacies of sense perception reveal the laws of nature. They are not deceptions. They are, any supposed perceptual error is merely an error in interpretation. He says, many things called deceptions of the senses are only conclusions rashly drawn from the testimony of the senses. Thus, when a man has taken a counterfeit guinea for a true one, he says his senses deceived him, but he lays the blame where it ought not to be laid. And of course, Rand likewise held that the evidence of the senses is an absolute, but man must learn to understand it. His mind must discover the nature, the causes, the full context of his sensory material. His mind must identify the things that he perceives. Now, Thomas Reed repeatedly described the existence of things perceived as axiomatic. And I love this. I love, when I got to this, my, my head just exploded with joy as to see this, that a modern philosopher is saying these things. He said, if the word axiom be put to signify every truth which is known immediately without being deduced from any antecedent truth, then the existence of the objects of sense may be called an axiom. He also says, all reasoning is from principles. The first principles of mathematical reasoning are mathematical axioms and definitions. And the first principles of all our reasoning about existences are our perceptions. So he thinks that the validity of the senses is obvious. It's not even something that we can or should try to argue for. All we can do is try to wipe away all the bad arguments against the senses that have been made in the fact, uh, in the past, sorry. It's a self-evident fact that, the, per, uh, that our perceptions are, uh, are giving us reality. And it's only ever questioned by philosophers. How many philosophers does it take to screw in a light bulb? One to screw it in and two to debate whether the light bulb exists and if it exists, whether or not man should impose his will on the world by screwing it in. So only philosophers are crazy enough to, uh, to, to question the validity of the senses, Reed thinks. He says that without relying on the senses, a man could not acquire the learning that enables him to question them. He writes, I gave implicit belief to the informations of nature by my senses for a considerable part of my life before I learned so much logic as to be able to start a doubt concerning them. And if he, if he hadn't, he continues, I should not even have been able to acquire that logic, which suggests these skeptical doubts with regard to my senses. So without, <clears throat> without the knowledge of the senses, he couldn't even have gained the knowledge to question the senses. And only philosophers, this is why only philosophers ever question the senses. He also says that we can show the absurdity of skeptics by pointing out that, quote, a first principle which a man rejects 
stands upon the same footing with others of which he admits. So we know this uh, same idea from Aristotle and from Rand. Rand said, uh, likewise, the arguments of those who attack the senses are merely variants of a stolen concept, of the fallacy of the stolen concept, which she defined as the fallacy of using a concept while denying other concepts on which it logically depends. And she also wrote, an axiom is a proposition that defeats its opponents by the fact that they have to accept it and use it in the process of any attempt to deny it. So Reed anticipates Rand, but really is just echoing Aristotle on this point. All right, so it's, we've been going for 45 minutes and it's been all epistemology, all pretty complicated stuff so far. So I just wanna take a minute, uh, breathe and recap. So point one was that Reed uh, throughout the theory of ideas is arbitrary. Point two, we directly perceive the world via sensations. There's this resemblance hypothesis is nonsense. And point three, the evidence of the senses is, is axiomatic and self-evident. Um, any questions before we move on to the good stuff or well, the easy stuff at least. So Carrie Ann dropped a question in the chat. If anybody else has questions, you can feel free to raise your hand to ask them yourself or put them in the chat and I'll read it for you. Um, Carrie Ann says, don't concepts have some kind of reality though in terms of being something in, in mind, an aspect of consciousness that we have as a thought that refers to particulars in the world. Quote, in this process, concepts serve as units and are treated epistemologically as if each were a single mental concrete, end quote. Yeah, so Rand does refer to concepts as something like a mental concrete. So I think there's uh, a certain tension between Rand and Reed, perhaps on this point, or maybe not. Uh, maybe their, their views are perfectly compatible. I think that ultimately Rand thinks that concepts are actions of the mind, that there are these mental integrations. Now, grammarians have this thing called nominalization, and we can take any action and construe it as a noun. And that's what I think Rand is doing here with mental integration. She's taking what is an act of the mind and construing, construing it as a noun. If you think about it, that noun is only possible via the unit perspective, which is using an action of the mind to, again, step back and look at itself and say, well, there is something like a unit here. And, and that unit is a product of our ability to act as, as uh, these selective focusers and selectively focus on this aspect of reality. So I think like it, it, be, it becomes hard, almost like one of those paintings that, you know, if you look at it one way, it's, it's a woman's face. You can look at it another, it's like a rat or something. Um, it becomes hard sometimes when you're reading read because you're like, wait a second, like ideas, actions, the mind, there seem to be things that are not um, so uh, I don't know how satisfactory of an answer that was, Carrie Ann, but I think that that's how Reed would put it, to the best of my knowledge. So concepts, they're something, but even that something is a mental integration, which is itself an act. It's not a thing. There's no metaphysical thing. The clearest, um, well, clear in some sense and unclear in others, but Rand in her, I believe, Psycho-Epistemology of Art says that uh, there, there are no there's no metaphysical reality to concepts and that in, man needs art because it makes his concepts real and perceivable in a sense. Go ahead, Karen. And just as a quick follow-up to that, not metaphysical reality in terms of it exists as a separate particular substance in the world, but mm -hmm. she does say in I, ITOE that uh, attributes of things have reality that depend on, you know, physical stuff. So, so things yeah. like transparency as um, it's real and it's something. So, uh, when something's an attribute, it has reality, uh, but uh, much like much like our consciousness does too. But as an aspect of our physical being. So, yeah. I, I just wanted to tease out the complexity of the way in which thoughts or mental concretes as she refers sometimes to concepts are real, but they don't, they're not real like a physically distinct entity, they're aspects of physical entities. Is that, yeah. how, and how would you connect that to what you were saying about Reed? Yeah, I think that, oh, well, Reed would definitely agree that all aspects are, are real things, but then the question is like, what would he think about um, these concepts as mental concretes? And I think that he would say, well, uh, they are, they're, they're actions of the mind that we can cognize in a certain way, such as to think of them as things, 
I think that's what he would say. But I'd love to discuss that more. I could talk about Reed all day. Antonio? Hi, uh, yeah, I was just um, interested in um, getting a better understanding of what Reed means by sensations versus perceptions. Yeah. So when he uses the term sensation, does he mean a characteristic of something like color or does he mean the characteristics of that object which are responsible for its perceived color? The, the first, not the second. So you'd okay. say that okay. it is something like our perception of color, but it's not something that we perceive. It's below the level of awareness. So sensations cause perception, but we're not actually aware of the yes. sensations themselves, okay. which again, there's another connection between Rand and Reed on this point, because Rand thinks that after a certain stage of developmental maturity, we no longer perceive or we're no longer aware of sensations directly. We're only aware of our integrations of those perceptions. So I'm glad you asked this question because Reed, this is one of the points that's still hotly contested among people that are interested in Reed is what exactly did Reed mean by these sensations? Uh, what are they? And I, I would liken it to something like my understanding of it is something like this. Um, you know, Hume and Locke sort of thought as sensations as all these sort of atoms, this sort of atomistic view of perception. Like we get a little splotch of red over here, a little splotch of hardness over there. And somehow like our minds sort of uh, jump to conclusions about what things are based on these sort of atomistic pieces of data. And I think what Reed is saying is that like, okay, so when we start out visually, our visual system cannot actually map three dimensions. All we're getting are colors. And so basically you can think of the mind like our TV screen from representationism. Uh, there are a bunch of pixels on the screen and each of those pixels is filled in with some kind of color. And over time, what we do is we actually integrate those sensations of color to mean things like depth and roundness and texture and things like that. So, but what happens though is we automatize the, the integrations between those, those sensations into perception such that we can no longer go back and pull out the independent sensations, the little atoms of perception. So, yeah, but just one thing, don't you think there's a problem with bundling atoms and colors in the same place? Because I think that the word sensation, the word sensation by itself presupposes consciousness in a sense, whereas reality doesn't. If you say sensation, then you don't just mean something that is being sensed, you also presuppose that something is sensing it. And if, if something is sensing it, then you can only refer to things like colors and smells and transparency, whereas an atom is just the objective cause I for see. that sensation. Sorry if but I confused you. When I said atoms, I was actually just using that as a metaphor because the uh, the views of Hume are often, he's often thought of as like a, or a sensory atomist in the sense that the individual components of data of our senses are like minute, just little particles or packets of data, sort of like what would go over a internet, uh, ethernet cable or something. So I don't actually mean atoms in the sense of physical atoms out there colliding. I mean like little pieces of data that we integrate into one image of, you know, for instance, the computer screen right in front of me now, there's like a bunch of different pieces of information that I have to integrate to see that one thing. So sorry if I confused you with the word Adam there. But Antonio, this is a really deep and interesting topic. Uh, I'd love to discuss it more in the Q&A. Uh, I'd love to get on to some of Reed's moral views, and then we can spend as much time as you guys want talking about all of this stuff. All right. So diving in, point, big point number four and final point for today is that Reed upheld a morality of self-interest in of achieving personally meaningful goals. Okay, so for an 18th century Protestant minister, Reed had surprisingly rational views in the realm of morality, likely because here too, he took cues from Aristotle. 
Um, so he thought that morality derives from human nature. The good is that comports with our nature as human beings, and the bad is that which does not comport with our nature as human beings. He wrote, as far as the intention of nature appears in the constitution of man, we ought to comply with that intention and to act agreeably to it. The lower animals, he thought, have no choice in this. They can't stand outside their nature, observe it, and then choose to act in accordance with their nature. Only man has that ability. He wrote, man only of the inhabitants of this world is made capable of, the, of the blah, observing his own constitution, what kind of life it is made for and acting according to that intention or contrary to it. And every virtuous action agrees with the uncorrupted principles of human nature. So despite differing opinions on good and bad, he thinks, there's a real distinction between right and wrong in human conduct. And it's as real as the distinction between matters of true and false in science. Virtue is the right use of our human powers and vice is the opposite. Longer quote here, everything virtuous and praiseworthy must lie in the right use of our power, everything vicious and blamable in the abuse of it. Knowledge derives its value from this, that it enlarges our power and directs us in the application of it. For in the right employment of our active power consists all the honor, dignity, and worth of a man, and in the abuse and perversion of it, all vice, corruption, and depravity. And of course, Rand would later say that all that which is proper to the life of a rational being is the good, all that which destroys it is the evil. And this relates uh, back to Carrie-Anne's point about man's ergon being derived from the fact that he has logos, so his uh, man's characteristic activity, his work as man uh, is derived from the fact that man is a rational being. Reed thinks much the same. He thinks that there are two basic springs to action, two motives that cause us to act in accordance with our nature and to act morally, which he considers to be one and the same. If we're acting in accord with our nature, then we're acting morally. He writes, what is good for us upon the whole and what appears to be our duty. These are the two springs to action. They are very strictly connected, lead to the same course of conduct and cooperate with each other. And on that account have commonly been comprehended under one name, that of reason. So he thinks that what is good for us upon the whole and what is our moral duty are really in the end, they're the same thing. We have two different names essentially for the same thing and they're comprehended as the same thing and that they're called reason. So we're supposed to act according to reason. These two are good upon the whole and duty are like two fountains whose streams unite and run in the same channel. So let's look at each of these two different springs to our action. So he has a chapter titled Of Regard to Our Good on the Whole, in which he writes, whatever makes a man more happy or more perfect is good and is an object of desire as soon as we are capable of forming the conception of it. The contrary is ill and is an object of aversion. Long quote, I apologize, but in this section, I'm going to quote read at length because his writing is so beautiful. And if I try to rewrite it, I just lose the nuance of it. So here it is. We learn to observe the connections of things and the consequences of our actions and taking an extended view of our existence, present and future, we correct our first notions of good and ill and form the conception of what is good or ill upon the whole, which must be estimated not from the present feeling or from the present animal desire or aversion, but from a due consideration of its consequences, certain or probable during the whole of our existence. That which taken with all its discoverable connections and consequences brings more good than ill upon the whole. That brute animals have any conception of this good, I have no reason to believe. And it is evident that man cannot have the conception of it till reason is so far advanced that he can seriously reflect upon the past and take a prospect of the future part of his, his, his existence. It appears therefore that the very conception of what is good or ill for us upon the whole is the offspring of reason and can only be in beings endowed with reason. So two springs to action, good for us upon the whole and our duty, and both of these are the offsprings of reason. So our good upon the whole requires that we extend our view both forward and backward. We have to think about our past actions, 
What were the consequences of those actions? We have to project into the future. What do we want to happen? Do we want to have these same things happening over and over again? We need to think about our, our good upon the whole. That which given the full context of our knowledge makes a man more happy or more perfect. So the goal of this is not some ascetic ideal. It is to make ourselves happy. And this is remarkably similar to Rand's rational self-interest and the objectivist ethics, and also to Aristotle's ethics in, in the Nicomachean ethics. He says that acting rationally, so suppose like, for instance, I'm in love with vintage guitars. Suppose I go out and I buy this really expensive vintage guitar that I really can't afford, or I'm really hungry and I'm at a restaurant with my friend and he goes to the bathroom. While he's in the bathroom, I eat like half of his meal. He said like acting rationally on these desires is actually not in your self-interest. He calls it, it's sacrificing self-love. So he says to call this acting from self-love, my eating my friend's food while he's in the bathroom, to call that self-love is to pervert the meaning of words. It is evident that in every case of this kind, self-love is sacrificed to appetite. So compare this to the Bible, for instance, compare this to uh, Romans um, chapter 12, verse 10. Be devoted to one another in love, honor one another, one another above yourselves. Rand is not really saying anything like that. He's saying, you know, you honor yourself. He's saying something much like Benjamin Franklin said, you're best to others when you're good to your, your best to yourself when you're good to others. Um, so Rand makes a very similar point about self-interest, but she makes it far more emphatically. She says, the meaning ascribed in popular usage to the word selfishness is not merely wrong. It represents a devastating intellectual package deal, which is responsible more than any other single factor for the arrested moral development of mankind. Also, this package deal combines the concept's legitimate meaning, concern with one's own interest, with the image of a murderous brute who tramples over piles of corpses to achieve his own ends, who cares for no living being and pursues nothing but the gratification of mindless whims of any immediate moment. So are we good? Or when we're uh, regarding our, our good on the whole, it aids us, says Reed, it aids us in being moral because consistently acting on the principle of our good upon the whole actually leads to the practice of every virtue, he says. He also says, and this is unfortunate, but he says it, that our good upon the whole is not the noblest principle of conduct, but it has this peculiar advantage, he says, its force is felt by the most ignorant and even the most abandoned. Uh, let a, a man's moral judgment be ever so little improved by exercise or ever so much corrupted by bad habits, he cannot be indifferent to his own happiness or misery. So it has this peculiar advantage that we all want to be happy. And so, you know, thinking about our good upon the whole is a really great way to be moral. So where does the principle of duty come in then? I'm reminded here of uh, Benjamin Franklin writing to a religious satirist. The uh, religious satirist had made fun of religion and Franklin reached out to him and he said, you know, not everybody can take such an extended view as you and project into the future all of the consequences of their actions. And so religion acts like a crutch for those not able to project what is in their best interest. And I think Reed gives a pretty much the same view. Um, he says concerning our first principle, the good upon the whole, he says that the right application of this principle to our conduct requires an extensive prospect of human life and a correct judgment and estimate of its goods and evils. He must be a wise man indeed, if any such man there be, who can perceive in every instance, or even in every important instance, what is best for him upon the whole, if he have no other rule to direct his conduct. So he characterizes duty as that what uh, that is what we ought to do, what is fair and honest. And this is really the, the most he gives in terms of what duty is, except it's not what we think of as duty typically. It's not moral commandments. He writes, duty or moral obligation appears to be neither any real quality of the action considered by itself, nor of the agent considered without respect to the action but a certain relation between the one and the other. When we say a man ought to do such a thing, the ought which expresses the moral obligation has respect on the one hand to the person who ought, 
and the omni the other to the action which he ought to do. Those two correlates are essential to every moral obligation. Take away either and it has no existence. So morality, moral duty, it's not intrinsic to any given action. It's contextual, depends on both the action and the person. Reed writes, the truth of all moral propositions depends upon the constitution and circumstances of the person to whom they are applied. The moral propositions depend on the person and they depend on his circumstances. So we're all dying to know what happens when our duty appears to conflict with what is good for us upon the whole. And Reed has a beautiful passage that I have to quote at length because it's just so good. <clears throat> Which of these ought to yield if they happen to interfere? Talking about good upon the whole and duty. Some well-meaning persons have maintained that all regard to ourselves and to our own happiness ought to be extinguished, Immanuel Kant probably, that we should love virtue for its own sake only, even though it were to be, if it were to be accompanied with eternal misery, definitely Immanuel Kant. This seems to have been the extravagance of some mystics which perhaps they were led into in opposition to a contrary extreme of the schoolmen of the Middle Ages, who made the desire of good to ourselves to be the sole motive to action and virtue to be approvable only on account of its present or future reward. So he's saying these mystics were reacting in response to these other guys who were saying we should just act on our desires and do whatever we want to do, do whatever feels good in the moment. Reed continues. Juster views of human nature will teach us to avoid both these extremes. On the one hand, the disinterested love of virtue is undoubtedly the noblest principle in human nature and ought never to stoop to any other. And let's recall that by virtue here, he means acting in accordance with man's nature. On the other hand, there is no active principle which God hath planted in our nature that is vicious in itself or that ought to be eradicated, even if it were in our power. They are all useful and necessary in our present state. The perfection of human nature consists not in extinguishing, but in restraining them within their proper bounds in keeping them in due subordination to the governing principles, namely reason. As to the supposition of an opposition between the two governing principles, that is between a regard to our happiness on the whole and a regard to our duty, that supposition is merely imaginary. There can be no such opposition. There's no practical, there's no dichotomy between morality and practicality, between happiness and virtue, Reed is saying. So obviously Rand vociferously denounced uh, the belief that the moral and the practical are opposites as a lethal tenet. She said that pits joy and whatever profits you against the good and the moral, and so presses man to choose either to be moral or to live. And Reed is saying that that moral practical dichotomy, it's merely illusory. It's on the same level as those who think of uh, the senses as being illusory. He held that duty is one of the most, sorry, Rand held that duty is one of the most destructive anti-concepts in the history of moral philosophy. Uh, but it's very clear that Reed's conception of duty has nothing to do with what Rand was talking about. There's no, no iota of uh, similarity to Kant's conception of duty, which is what she was talking about. Um, important here in Reed's moral philosophy is that even these less rational springs to action, our appetites and our desires, when kept in check by reason, actually supplement virtue and lead men to do good things. Reed writes, to eradicate them, if it were possible, to eradicate things like our ambition, our desire to uh, see thing, cool things in the world happen. If we could eradicate those, if it were possible, it would be like cutting off a leg or an arm, he says. The evils which ambition has produced in the world are a common topic of declamation, but it ought to be observed that where it has led to one action hurtful to, to society has led to 10,000 that are beneficial to it. And we justly look upon the want of ambition as one of the most unfavorable symptoms in a man's temper. So compare that to Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Doesn't seem to be what this preacher is telling us. Thomas Reed held that the passions when governed by reason and kept within their proper bounds, give life and vigor to the whole man. And without them, man would be a slug, he says. Uh, so when we think about discoveries and inventions and great works of art, 
all the superb things out there. They require intense industry to bring about. And those who put forth the effort are the ones who have a love and admiration bordering upon enthusiasm, Reed says. So to think that we may with justice allow no small merit to the passions, even in the discoveries and improvements of the arts and sciences. Indeed, Reed thinks that being passionate about things is the only way to truly live. He says, man's good consists in the vigorous exertion of his active and intellective powers upon their proper objects. He is made for action and progress and cannot be happy without it. That tranquility of soul in which some place human happiness is not a dead rest, but a regular progressive motion. So a life of unbroken leisure, of you know, sitting on the beach, sipping margaritas, that's not Reed's notion of an ideal life. We can't be happy just doing that all the time. We must passionately pursue some useful work. One last long quote from Reed, and I promise we'll wrap up here. A dog that is made for the chase cannot enjoy the happiness of a dog without that exercise. Keep him within doors, feed him with the most delicious fare, give him all the pleasures his nature is capable of. He soon becomes a dull, torpid, unhappy animal. No enjoyment can supply the want of that employment which nature has made his chief good. Let him hunt and neither pain nor hunger nor fatigue seem to be evils. Deprived of this exercise, he can relish nothing. Life itself becomes burdensome, and it is no disparagement to the humankind to say that man, as well as the dog, is made for hunting and cannot be happy but in some vigorous pursuit. He has indeed nobler game to pursue than the dog, but he must have some pursuit, otherwise life stagnates. All the faculties are benumbed, the spirits flag, and his existence becomes an unsupportable burden. These ideas that Reed is talking about have never been better dramatized than in the novels of Ayn Rand. And Howard Rourke building, uh, building after building, and Dagny Taggart creating Taggart, uh, creating uh, the John Galt line, and Hank Reardon creating Reardon Metal. Productive achievement is man's noblest activity, said Fran, and we see her heroes give every fiber of their being to achieving their goals. Rand, uh, Reed also understood that seeing other people's achievement is a powerful elixir. And he said, while he views what is truly great and glorious in human conduct, his soul catches the divine flame and burns with desire to emulate what it admires. When we contemplate a noble character, though but in ancient history or even in fiction, like a beautiful object, he gives a lively and pleasant emotion to the spirits. It warms the heart and invigorates the whole frame. Like the beams of the sun, it enlivens the face of nature and diffuses heat and light all around. We feel a sympathy with every noble and worthy character that is represented to us. We rejoice in his prosperity. We are afflicted in his distresses. We even catch some sparks of that celestial fire that animated his conduct and feel the glow of his virtue and magnanimity. I slipped in one more quote for you. All right, so to recap, <clears throat> Reed was not a proto-objectivist in any sense. He said plenty that objectivists would get would think is wrong. Uh, my purpose today is integrations between Rand and Reed, and I think there are many, and uh, many beautiful passages here that, to show that. Um, I definitely encourage people to go and, and study Reed for themselves and find out all the, the distinctions between them as well. But he said so much that was right, and in fact, in, in epistemology and ethics, I think he got more right than virtually any philosopher between Aristotle and Ayn Rand. Of course, he was building off the ideas of people like John Locke, people like Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton, but he got so much right. He forcefully attacked uh, skepticism and the anything goes uh, moral subjectivism that was beginning to become rampant. And among modern philosophers, Reed single-handedly upheld this direct realism against presentationism. He used his scientific expertise to show why the senses are a valid source of knowledge and an axiomatic source of knowledge. And he said that despite the extravagance of some mystics, I love that, uh, there's no conflict between the moral and the practical. These two things are promoting our good upon the whole. So that is Thomas Reed in a nutshell. I hope that you are as excited to dive into Reed's works as I was when I first discovered him. Thank you.
Thanks for a great presentation, John. Carrion has dropped another question in the chat. Um, and then if anybody else wants to ask questions, we can get to those. If I could, okay, so Carrion says, is the integration of the human good and duty via reason influenced by Aquinas's dual reason and revelation approach? That sounds a lot like Aquinas's summa and Reed was religious after all. Yeah, I don't know, but I'd suppose that you're probably right about that. It'd be interesting to dig into. Reed was incredibly well read and it would, it would be bizarre to my mind if he wasn't familiar with the writings of Aquinas being, as you said, both a preacher and a fan of Aristotle. So I don't know, uh, but, but I think it's a, a good lead to look into. There's a lot of work, by the way, to be done on, um, on Thomas Reed as a figure, on integrating his ideas like I've been doing today and asking these questions and answering them because the story of modern philosophy that we've been told for the past 200 years is a story of the growth of skepticism and it completely leaves out the Reedian alternative. So there's a massive amount of work to be done because people have just ignored Reed for so long that you know it's almost, it's, it's deuces wild. And if you're interested in Reed, you can kind of get in and just start finding these questions, these interesting questions and answering them. So my way of turning that into a, um, other questions. Yeah, so Antonio has a rather long question. I think it ties into Barbara's question here. So I'm gonna ask them both if that's all right. So Antonio says, uh, Rand says happiness is not the standard of value life is. And I understand it's because only living things can value because without life, there can be no values. But if life is the standard, couldn't one argue for keeping a well-fed prisoner? I can argue that no well-fed prisoner would be happy, but that would be arguing from the purpose of happiness. We must argue from the standard life instead. So is life the standard of value or is it happy life? Or does Rand imbue the idea of happiness into life by declaring that the well-fed prisoner situation is not mere existence, is mere existence, but not life? Yeah, I think that this question comes up when people confuse standard and purpose. So the standard is like a is like a yardstick or a ruler that you use to measure things. So for instance, last summer I built a recording studio in my basement. And my end goal was my own happiness at having this great recording studio and having like a really cool looking studio. But if that was the yardstick that I used to measure the beams that I was putting up against the wall, then I couldn't have possibly built my studio. I'd be like, what will make me happy? That will tell me how long to make this beam. So I'll just cut this beam at whatever degree makes me happy. Like the, the standard is very much like a ruler. So um, the, the standard of life means that if we want to actually achieve our happiness, which is our moral purpose in life, then we need a certain measuring stick by which to measure different actions, different alternatives that are out there in front of us. So we, we need life as the standard by which to measure the, the uh, outcomes of different things and to figure out what will make us achieve our purpose, which is our happiness. So I didn't get into the prisoner per se, but I think that answers the question anyway. Let me know if not. Uh, sorry, carry on. I just called you John in the chat. Um, so then Barbara's question, which is related is, isn't it- to me. <laughs> She's giving you a recommendation actually. So. Um, so Barbara yeah. says, isn't it one's own life that is the standard of value? So that, that sort of relates to the question, but I don't think we touched on yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it's your own life is, is the standard of value, but there are certain things that we know promote life in general. So taking lots of cocaine and sitting on your couch is not going to promote your life. So we need um, we need to take actions that we know are life serving actions for the purpose of making our own lives great. So um, I think that uh, Reed, you know, Reed doesn't really talk about this specifically, but I, I think that he's, he's talking about our functions as human beings using our, our, our minds. So he's got like a functional argument that's very much, I think, inspired by Aristotle. It's that we are, are beings with a rational faculty and we ought to use that faculty. And the purpose of doing, of doing so is to achieve our own happiness. Um, you know, whatever makes a man more happy and more perfect is the way that he put it. <clears throat> and uh, Pierre Le Mauvin, you actually recommended him to me, Carrie Ann, uh, while I was writing, by the way, I wrote an, an article on Reed for the Objective Standard called Common Sense for Objectivists, Five Reasons for Fans of Ayn Rand to Study Thomas Reed. And uh, I actually quote Mervon a few times in there because he's got great 
uh, just great descriptions of what direct realism is and is not. And I think it comports really well with Reed's ideas. I will include that link with the links in the class as well um, that Carrie Ann's shared for Lemovan's work. Um, Antonio and Barbara, are you guys good with the answers to those questions or do you have a follow-up? Does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, we have, have plenty of time for follow-up too. So yeah, I have a question. I just don't want to if, if some I can ask you a question anytime I like. So <laughs> well, we should get it on the recording here for everyone that's not uh, going to be able to Barbara, you unmuted. Were you wanting to, to speak up? Well I uh, um, I was reading the that long prisoner um, question, and I thought, you know, the standard of value is not, I don't think is life in general. So everybody's life is the standard of value. The prisoner's life wouldn't be of value to me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said it, isn't it one's own life that's the standard of value? And the happiness is the measurement of that. Yeah, and was what I think you're saying. When we get to the, the social context, that's where we have the concept of rights that bridges ethics with politics. And so uh, this becomes a matter of not violating rights and how do we do that, how do we deal with criminals, but we have to put them in a place where they can't hurt other people. So their lives might not be of value to us, but their lives are presumably of value to them. And um, we have to we have to act in a way that doesn't violate their rights. Mm, yeah. Um, OK, so the question I had, John, if you don't mind, is going back to his uh, epistemology. And I was just wondering if there are any, as far as you're aware, are there any effects of um, of religion on Reed's epistemology. So for example, with Descartes, you saw him musing over, uh, you know, maybe God puts some concepts in our head and things like that. I don't yeah. think he ended up going with that, but um, do you see anything like that, any sort of fingerprints of religion on Reed's epistemology? Yeah, definitely. So this is uh, one of the things I didn't stress because one of the uh, differences, big differences between Reed and Rand. Uh, for instance, he accepts the, um, the, not the analytic synthetic dichotomy, but the dichotomy uh, the um, contingent and, um, and yeah, what, sorry, Carrie Ann, what's the dichotomy that Kant gave us, um, uh, or perhaps it was Hume before him, the contingent or the, the analytical, so there are analytical truths and there are synthetic truths. So uh, synthetic and analytic dichotomy. Well, so contingent is juxtaposed with necessary. Mm -hmm. It didn't have contingent, it doesn't have to be the case, but necessary truths are ones that must be the case. That's right. And um, so analytic truths are those where we can look at, for instance, the definition of a triangle. If we say something like a triangle has four sides, well, that analytically is false because the triangle is something that we know by its definition, whereas synthetic truths are um, the boiling point for water is, I don't know, 114 degrees, or the freezing point for water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so analytic truths are things where we look out at the world and we put together our observations and come inductively to some uh, piece of knowledge. So Reed accepts the uh, this dichotomy and he it seems to accept it in a really strange way. If I recall correctly, it's that basically, Almost everything is uh, is contingent or is analytical because it's based upon God's will. So it's because God decided that water freezes at 32 degrees that it does. Uh, so he he accepts this dichotomy and it plays some havoc, I think, in his epistemological views. Um, that's the big one that comes to mind. I'd have to think, but I could probably pull up a few others from my notes, uh, if you're interested in digging into that. Kiria? Yeah, actually, now that you're bringing up this connection between uh, Reed's religious uh, views and his epistemology, uh, is it also the case that what he thinks, the, the reason why we can take our, our sense perception as a given and that there, our senses are valid just as we can take it to be the case that our principles of human nature are going to lead to the good, so we, we should rely on and trust them and use our reason properly, is that God has made us in such a way 
that we can trust our senses and also that these uh, rational principles kind of implanted in our nature are ones that if we uh, uh, follow within limits are going to lead us to the good. So I'm curious if that's doing a lot of work in both as epistemology and ethics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, good question. Um, you know, he does refer to, to God quite a bit, but I don't think he, he really bases his views on that. Um, so he's known as a common sense realist, and he seems to just think that the, the principles of common sense are just dictated by nature. And perhaps you would under that say, well, like, you know, Jefferson did nature and nature's God. Um, so ultimately, these things are the, caused by God. But um, he, I don't think, really bases his views too much on, on that, uh, especially in, in epistemology. It's, well, human nature is the way it is, and there are certain principles of common sense, and these derive from our nature, and um, we ought not to, to try to circumvent them in any way. Okay, so he's not like what philosophers would call a reliableist, because God has made us reliable, that's where we right. trust him. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I bet that you could find evidence for both sides of this question and read like you can with many philosophers. But like thinking back like to the bulk of his arguments, he's he's not as he is often characterized as doing. It's just dogmatically saying, well, God made us such that we can gain knowledge by sense perception. Ergo, we can gain knowledge by sense, sense perception. He's really... Uh, like a, a very profound scientific thinker and he brings a lot of science to bear on this. Um, so yeah, I, th I think you could find evidence for that view, but honestly, in my opinion, that is not really the basis of all of his arguments. But, you know, his, his book on epistemology, it's a nice doorstop. So I encourage you to read it and tell me what you think. This has been so fun. Um, are there any other questions? If not, I want to make just one final point about Reed and his legacy. Okay, so I think that there are lots of historical connections, by the way, between Reed and Rand. There's no, de there's no definitive proof that Rand was ever introduced to Reed's ideas, but his ideas were taught at Petrograd State University and several of the philosophers there were familiar with Reed's ideas to some extent. Um, I detail that in my essay for TOS. There are some lessons though from Reed's legacy that are not in that essay that I'd like to briefly share now. So for decades after Reed's death, common sense realism, Reed's philosophy was one of the most influential philosophies in the world in both Europe and America. And it fueled the Scottish enlightenment and inspired the, the founding fathers. John Witherspoon and William Small were both very, very much, uh, Witherspoon, I think, actually called himself a common sense realist or was uh, very sympathetic to Reed's ideas. And these, of course, were the professors, respectively, to James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. There's also James William, uh, James Wilson, sorry. Uh, he was one of only six people to sign both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. He spoke more at the Constitutional Convention than any other founding father except Governor Morris. Um, and he quoted Reed verbatim and his famous lectures on law and is in his most important case as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Chisholm v. Georgia in 1793. So Reed was very prominent throughout the world. So the question is what happened to Reed's prominence? And I think that one large factor of this was branding problems, we'd, we'd say today. There are two other guys who call themselves common sense realists, James Beatty and James Oswald. And their writings were often combined and sent out into the world as one product and sort of indiscriminately equated. And this, uh, this was the case, Immanuel Kant equated the three, and so did Joseph Priestley. Joseph Priestley wrote a book, uh, History in the Present State of Electricity, which popularized the work of Benjamin Franklin, which at the time was the most interesting scientific subject in the world. Everybody wanted to learn about electricity. So Priestley became sort of a household name through his popularization of Franklin's work. But Priestley also wrote a book attacking Reed and attacking 
common sense realists in general, but in so doing, he equated these three thinkers, James Beatty and James Oswald were not very careful thinkers, not very good writers, and they made many mistakes, and they were very sort of dogmatic. So when you go and read, for instance, B.A.G. Fuller's or Wilhelm Wundelbahn's accounts of Thomas Reed, what you get is a sort of dismissive look at Reed as, well, he was just sort of dogmatic. He, he basically, what they say is what you said a minute ago, carry on, that, uh, well, he believed that God made us in a certain way, and so he just dogmatically held that up. If you actually read his work, that's not a, at all what he says. So Reed's uh, Reed had branding problems. He was packaged with other thinkers that really didn't understand common sense realism, really didn't understand Reed's ideas and didn't present them well, which is, I think, a great lesson for objectivists today, because we need to make sure that we understand these ideas and that we don't associate with people that don't and that that actually say things that are not objectivism. And there, there's also another aspect of this, which is really interesting, sort of an inside job. So one of the first British scholars to go to Germany and learn in German universities was this guy named Sir William Hamilton. And he became a student, not literally student of Kant, but he was a student of Kant's philosophy and of Hegel's philosophy. And he, when he came back to England, he became the editor of Reed's works. And he tried to create this synthesis between Kantianism and Thomas Reed's philosophy. And it sunk the whole thing, of course. You can't synthesize these two things that are absolutely opposed. And so I think he effectively destroyed common sense realism from the inside out. And so, you know, we're, there are sort of these, all these, these battles in objectivism about, um, you know, we need to like think about the purity of the philosophy. I think that to some extent, we ought to be concerned with how objectivism is presented to the world because we don't want the sorts of branding problems that sunk common sense realism, which was once the most, one of the most influential philosophies in the world. So parting thoughts on common sense realism and its connection to objectivism. Thank you guys uh, for your questions. I definitely invite more questions. I hope this was interesting enough to elicit the waterfall of questions that Carrie Ann has been getting. And uh, I'd love to talk more about Thomas Reed guys at any point. So you can email me at john at the Thank you. <laughs>